How are you placing your posterior composites? Are you doing like me? Are you doing cusp by cusp? Or have you discovered another technique? Well, I'm going to start by giving you a warning, Petrus Rati. This episode may completely change the way you place your posterior composites. I'm talking here bread and butter, daily restorative dentistry. It might just completely foundationally change it to the core. And of course, it's got to be for the better. So the technique that we talk about today, the fast modeling technique or the fast modeling bulk technique, this could be an absolute game changer for you in your practice. I know I have internalized it. And thanks to our chat with Ahmed Tadfi today, even now, I myself am changing the way I place my posterior composites. Because although I enjoy the cusp to cusp and getting the nice anatomy, and something I was taught on course many, many years ago, and I've just been doing it and I'm in a good flow, I just feel that the efficiency can be a bit lacking. You know, doing two millimeter increments, use something called the snow plow technique, which Ahmed also uses, so he'll talk, I'll let him explain that in the middle of the episode. And, and whilst I'm happy with how my composites look, and thankfully, post-op sensitivity is not an issue uh, in my hands. So for me to change, you know, I'm resistant because when you have a winning formula, why should you change? But the number one reason I will be changing to this fast modeling technique, also known as the espresso technique, which you, you'll hear about. I just I just love it. The whole one shot concept, which uh, will go into full detail. But the lure of it, the attractiveness of this technique is the efficiency part. And that's where I really crave now. Look, for many of us general dentists, this is how we feed our families. This is like bread and butter, daily stuff that we do. So there's always a risk involved when you're changing something foundational such as this. And I've got a feeling that after listening to Dr. Ahmed Tatvi today, if you're not already using this technique, then you're probably going to consider changing. But if you're already using this technique, the step-by-step way that we approach this episode and how meticulous, you know, that's a great word to describe Dr. Ahmed Tatvi. Absolutely meticulous, man. And the meticulous detail that we go into is really going to make it tangible. So if you're already using this technique, it'll give you good validation. And I'm sure you're going to pick up a pearl or two from Ahmed. I actually remember visiting this technique hands-on in a a workshop in Singapore like seven, eight years ago. But I left that workshop, although it seemed like a good idea to me, I left with too many questions and I didn't get the clarity I needed. So when I visited this technique again with Ahmed for this episode, it cleared those doubts I had. I just had some doubts about sealing the dentine and the C-factor issue and all these things were going on in my mind back then. But now they've truly been answered. So now I'm ready to change this very foundational part of my dentistry. But it's changes like these, the things like these that we pick up and it actually makes our day-to-day dentistry more exciting. I do have to say that just because Uncle Jazz said it and Ahmed said it and he's making a good argument, if it doesn't make sense to you, please don't switch this technique. Okay? And, I mean, in dentistry, never change to a technique just because you read it once or you came across it through a podcast. It really has to make sense to you. So what I'll be doing is on Protrusive Guidance, our free platform, our community platform, which also has some paid plans, but essentially the platform, the community element of it is absolutely free. On there, I'll put together which composites you can use for this technique because you can actually be doing your patient a massive disservice if you're using the wrong type of composite for this technique. It has to be a specific composite and a clinical trial that was posted using this technique, comparing it to the cusp by cusp buildup. So if you still need to carry out some due diligence before you change your technique. I think that's a great thing, but I'll make those available to you all on Protrusive Guidance. The website for that, as always, is protrusive.app. For this episode, which will be worth 1.5 hours of CPE or CDE credits, so it might take a a couple of commutes to to digest this one, but I tell you, this is really, really important. Now, if you want to, if you really want to skip the foreplay and you want to go to around about halfway mark when he actually gets into the details of the step-by-step posterior composite part, then be my guest. But by doing that, you're going to miss something really foundational. You're going to miss some really important journey stuff. How Ahmed faced a few setbacks and failures across his career, which is actually quite inspirational. But but then also, if you're going through a bad patch, then trust me, you want to hear the first half. It'll help us to tap back into our motives and why we got into dentistry and how we're in this wonderful profession. No matter what people say, all the doom and gloom, just to keep remembering, we are in a really great artistic profession. I'm hoping that episodes like these ones will rekindle your passion. The entire ethos of the community and protrusive guidance is falling in love with dentistry again and the nicest and geekiest dentists in the world. The protrusive dental pearl is actually taken from this episode, but it's, it's, it's so good it needs to be emphasized again. When we're handling composite, composite does not like to be dragged. You know, you might remember dragging it with a probe and as you're dragging it, kind of leaving like this thin trail of composite as you're dragging it and it starts to look a little bit messy. 
And maybe that increment of composite is slumping in the wrong direction. And, and so it's well known that actually we shouldn't be dragging composite, which is why you see so many people using those brushes, right? I'm a big fan of the brush when I'm working anteriorly. One I use by, by GC, you get this autoclavable handle and then you get these little brush tips that you put on. I know Cosmoden also do some brushes. So these brushes are widely available and they overcome this dragging issue. But the other way for this technique, the fast modeling technique, what you want to do, and it'll make more sense when you get to, to middle to the end of the episode, is when you're actually doing the cut of your composite. And when you're listening at the end, I actually thought he meant cutting back the composite once you cured it. So I completely misinterpreted that. And then that's why we re revisited it and just made a lot more sense. When, you're, when you have your uncured soft composite mass and you're making your cuts with the probe or the fissure instrument as he uses, you are not to drag, do not drag. You're doing like this up and down cutting motion. See, cutting is much kinder and nicer to the composite than dragging. Do not drag composite. That's the pearl right there. This is to be applied anteriorly, posteriorly. No dragging, guys. Use some brushes if you need to avoid dragging anteriorly. And you'll end up with a better result. Hello, Patrice Strati. I'm Jazz Galati. I'm forgetting to introduce myself nowadays. I, you, know, you guys are all family. Most of you are returning viewers. But if you're new to the podcast, welcome. You picked a bloody good one to join us on. Before we join it, I just want to give an announcement about the offer that's ending on 3rd of March. So, Protrusive Guidance is a free platform, right? If you want to come for the love of the community and a place to discuss your cases and just be a sponge and absorb and grow and learn together, then come and join us. The website is protrusive.app. We do have a human process of approving each person. So, if we have any doubt that you are not a dental professional, you ain't coming in. So if you're still waiting for an approval, chances are you haven't checked an email that Marie has sent you to just validate, maybe asking for a certificate for those who we found it difficult to verify. Now, some of you will want to take advantage of the ultimate educational plan. That plan is £39 a month or $49 US dollars a month. There's also a plan in euros and Aussie dollars for my Aussie fans out there. If you take advantage of the annual plan, you get 27% off. And that generous 27% off expires on 3rd of March. So if you're on the fence, you know, you need to make up your mind by 3rd of March. If you want to go all in on Protrusive, all the education that we have to offer, do it before 3rd of March to get 27% off on the annual plan. And listen, if you, if you get the plan and if all you do, or if it's just one thing that you do, is that you watch Verti Pretz of Plonkers, the five videos, approximately just over an hour each, and you'll be able to then prepare your first vertical crown for a premolar using something called the shoulderless technique. That's the mission. Then you will have got your money's worth, like way, way more than your money's worth just by doing that one mini course. We've also got Sectioning School launching just by the time when this one comes out. So by the time this comes out, Sectioning School, 4K high quality videos of me sectioning teeth for extraction. So this is probably be the best clinical footage of extractions you've ever seen. I'm no oral surgeon, but I'm a generous sharer. And you've got my classic commentary as I go through each bit. So 3rd of March the date, if you're interested in the ultimate educational plan, it's a good time to upgrade to an annual plan. Let's take advantage of that 27% off. Oh, and by the way, if you're in Ireland, if you're one of my Irish Petrusrati, I'm so sorry. For some reason, the banks are having issues authenticating. So some of you are having to pay by Apple and various other ways. And I, I have no control of this. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's been a surprise. You know, I've got dentists from Estonia, India, UAE all b b joining in the fun. But for some reason, if you're in Ireland, the banks are, are not liking Petrusive at the moment. I, I don't know what it is. Which is a real shame because my top three Petrusrati, it's like choosing your children. Like, who are my top three sets of fans? I would say it's the Irish. Because over the years, the Irish have been the one that have been kept, kept me going with their emails. Their generosity with their kind words and encouragement. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the Irish Petrus Rati for that. This, the second group that I'm going to get a shout out is the Ghanaians. If you're a Petrus Rati in Ghana, I love you. God bless you. You guys are always there on my live webinars and all the courses we do. So thank you so much. And the third group are from Birmingham in the UK. I don't know what it is, but there's a hotspot in Birmingham, which has the most protrusive per square meter of the world in that place. So shout out to all the Brummies. Anyway, enough of my ramblings. Let's join this epic episode with Dr. Ahmed Tadfi. You can thank me later. We'll catch you in the mid-roll and in the outro. Welcome to the Protrusive Zone podcast. I've been admiring your work from Thanks. afar, I guess, on social media and your journey and stuff. So it's great to have you here as part of Adhesive Month. So February is Adhesive Month and uh, we're talking about bread and butter composites. And I'm really excited just to break down your protocols about how we can make our posterior composites faster, more predictable, efficient, hopefully sexier, all those things, basically. Uh, before we get to that. Ahmed, tell us about you. Tell us about your career aspirations. Tell us about your journey. I always want to spend a bit of time to unpack each individual's journey. Thank you very much, Jazz. I'm super excited to be on your podcast. I've been seeing a few of them in the past, but it feels quite surreal to be part of it. So actually, I had a very long journey to dentistry. When I was 12 or 13, my dream was to be an architect, actually. 
I remember in year 10, we had an opportunity to do a work experience in the field of choice that we were aspiring to go into. And I remember feeling quite disappointed with that career choice because it wasn't what I thought. So I, I really like art. I really like sitting and precision and things like that. And I realized, no offense to the architects at the time, but all we were doing was making cups of tea and doing nothing really. So I, I didn't feel that it was applicable to me because I also wanted the science part of what we do. So having that like patient communication or people communication as well as the artistic side of like, you know, making people's smiles better and changing their life actually. So, I mean, although our medic counterparts have banter mm -hmm. with us, we actually do change people's lives in many ways just by doing, you know, simple things or more complex things. So yeah, I then was walking by my, my own dentist and I just thought, I just saw a before and after picture and I thought, wow, this is really incredible. Like, the difference. So I remember walking upstairs and saying to the dentist, uh, is it possible to do work experience again? I've just done work experience, but I wasn't really satisfied. So I just feel like this, this is my career choice. And he said, okay, let's see how I can put you off this. And <laughs> as they say, you know, the rest is history. I started doing every Saturday is just going and watching and learning from different specialties and I, I got really attached to it and I, I kept saying to my friends I want to be an endodontist I want to be an endodontist what the hell is an endodontist I was like oh that's a root canal specialist and I mean weirdly I still enjoy root canal treatment like it's one of my favorite things to do not a specialist at it but I really still enjoy it and uh yeah didn't get my grades went to quite a rough school so it wasn't very easy to get grades had a supply teacher every other week we had wow. fights in exams and uh, people this, this murdering London, yeah. what, people. What, 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 what part yeah, of <laughs> central London. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it was, it was quite a rough place. But I guess that it built my character a little bit and it made me really push through. So I had to do biomedical science. And then, again, I was really lucky because I just about scraped a 2-1. But fortunately, I had a conditional offer from Birmingham. And, yeah, then I started to realize the dream and even to this moment, 10 years post-grad almost, I still can't believe that I'm a dentist, which is quite weird. That's beautiful. And then it's a bit like when you pass your driving test second time around, just remember and you appreciate and you appreciate the struggle. A lot of our colleagues, they kind of fell into it by accident. You had this determination. And I, and I hear this story on the podcast where, you know, I really wanted it, but I didn't get it first time. And I had to go around. And then it's a bit like when you pass your driving test second time around, just tastes a bit sweeter and you really appreciate it a little bit more sometimes. Uh, and, I, and I've heard this again, the same story again and again. And I think it's, it's so nice to reflect back and tap into that feeling, that desire you had at one stage. I mean, you know, I've been wanting to, I wanted to be a dentist since I was 14. And I really remember just praying that I get the offers and I got the offers and praying I got the grades and just being so, so desperate that I wanted to do it before going into the profession. And it's so easy once you're there to be like, you know, to not appreciate it for all yes. the seeing, for all the doom and gloom. And so I love that you said that. It's a really important reminder. Two main reminders from reflections on Ahmed's message there, guys, is number one, that doesn't matter what grades you get, that will not determine the quality of your work and success. The grades does not equal success, uh, even at dental school and before whatever. So forget about grades, okay? I think still to apply yourself, do your best. But just because you didn't get the top mark doesn't mean you can't be a fantastic dentist and, and have a fulfilling and, and a career full of enjoyment. And the other one is uh, just remember why you came into the profession and tap into that energy when you're feeling a bit down. Absolutely. I'll just add to that, actually. Uh, you mentioned about dental school, even dental school. I wasn't really a lecture person. I, I liked to listen to a lecture, but I wasn't one of those people that would take notes down and go over things. I was more practical, hands-on, wet-fingered. So even a third year, I had to repeat the third year, which for me worked out the best thing ever because it was the easiest year, ironically, <laughs> when I failed <laughs> from one subject. But it was the one subject in biomaterials but it made me do all the other subjects again without having to do any exams for them. But in addition to that, have an extra year of clinics. So at the end of fifth year, I managed to pick up like a couple of awards from dental school, which even I wouldn't have imagined that I would 
be sort of in the position to. So what I want to say about that is that the time I felt horrible, I felt sad, I felt like I let down my parents, my friends were moving up and I was like making new friends or had to be making new friends. So if anyone's in that position, I really believe that God always works in ways that we don't understand. So That's everything serious. that happens, yeah, it just happens for the best for you. Like I always tell the story to friends and even patients about the king and his apprentice who would always go out and about and his apprentice, whatever happens, would say to him, oh, this is God knows best, God knows best. So one day the king cuts his arm and, and the apprentice says, oh, don't worry, God knows best. And the king says, how dare you say that? I've just lost my arm. How can you say God knows best? Go to prison. And the next day the king goes out without his apprentice, gets caught by a tribe, and the tribe take him to sort of give him to their gods or their spirits as a gift. And they realize his hands dropped off. So they say, oh, we cannot give this to our gods with, with the hands chopped off. Release him. So the king goes back. He pulls his apprentice from prison and tells him, oh, look, this is what happened to me. You were right. God does know best. But tell me one thing. What happened to you? You ended up in prison. So that was a bad thing for you, surely. He said, well, if I was with you, they would have let you go, but they would have taken me because I had nothing. <laughs> So God does know best. So just like a, a funny story, but it really does. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't change a lot if you have to do another year. I know a lot of great clinicians that had to do another year, but just think of it in that way. Mm -hmm. God I appreciate you sharing that parable. Very good. And just to uh, <laughs> different learning styles, like you, you were like not intellectuals. I mean, I was massively into my lectures. I used to be there front row. Eat, and most of the time, I was happy to be sitting by myself, front row, had my t iPad out, I was recording the audios, I was typing notes, there's a really cool app at the time called SoundNote, and I was in love with it and stuff, so I was, I was always really, really into it in, in that way, but everyone's <laughs> got different learning styles and stuff, but regardless, if I hadn't done as well academically, I don't think that's what determines your, your success in the future. The theme that I've covered, you know, to add on to a parable you mentioned that so many times in a podcast four is you know, the whole Steve Jobs quote, right? You can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking back, and so that's always a, a good thing theme to revisit. Now, the main mm -hmm. topic for today, Amit, that was brilliant. Uh, the main topic for today is the espresso technique, which I really want to just, you know, we're in there before we hit record button, we're telling you about it and then how it used to be known as a fast modeling technique for composites. And so I'm really excited because I don't, I don't use this at the moment, but I know that I'm going to give it a go after we, our chat today. So my job is to make it tangible enough for myself and then to also, through that energy, make it tangible for the Petrusarati uh, so that we can actually have all the benefits of it. So I think the best way to approach this would be is why don't we just look into how you were taught to place a posterior composite and maybe as a new grad, the techniques you were doing, like my anatomy in the past, when you're a new grad, it's, you know, it's, it's hit and miss. You spend a lot of time doing clues adjustment. Um, you don't, you're kind of lost. You don't know the sequence uh, and eventually you pick up, okay, let's turn it into a class one first, do the marginal ridge first, and you figure that out. But then you're always developing your style, you go on courses, you experiment, you always think about how can I minimize that shrinkage stress. So I want to hear the warts and all story of your own progression, your own approach, your own recipe for your posterior composites, and what ha how that led to, and then we'll break down the espresso technique. So please, Ahmed, over to you. So again, very interesting one. For the first three years post-grad, I must admit, they were probably the most difficult years of my career because I qualified thinking, wow, this is the dreams come true. And then going into practice thinking, oh my God, what the hell have I done? Like, you know, from numbers of patients to not knowing everything or just being able, not being able to find the right materials, the right instruments not working with the same staff members and I thought gosh this is really tough back to the clinical part of things the way I was placing composites was kind of similar to what we were taught at university so try to get some isolation whether it's rubber dam or not again this was a struggle at the beginning because we didn't really know what rubber dam was in the practice I did but no one else did and it was but like you, were you, as a new grad were you using <laughs> just interesting because everyone's different yeah, new grad, new grad. probably aren't using uh, are not using rubber dam and they fall into bad habits and they fall out of habit of using it um even though they were taught mm. in school uh, as a new grad were you quite pro rubber dam from the start yeah yeah so i had a really ocd picky thing about 
rubber dam and auditing all my endos. So for the first two years of my career, I remember walking around with like two USBs and putting every single endo x-ray that I did. Good, bad, long, short, exposed, perforated, you name it, it was all on there. And I said to myself, this would be my kind of self critique because for me, you're your worst critique. You're your worst sort of uh, analyst, if you like. And that was what I was using to improve. Now, with regards to composites, I mean, I was very fortunate to be taught by the late Lewis McKenzie, rest is in, in peace in, in his soul. He was like instrumental to everything I do now. He was the, the guy that made me fall in love with the artistic part of dentistry and being interested in how to make them look beautiful, but functional and all of that. But once you qualify, you don't have the time that you had at, you, at dental school to be able to afford to do that. But there was me trying to push the boundaries and trying to do what I thought was the best thing to do for the patients and spend one, two, two and a half, three hours on one tooth. And in the end, I would find that once I took the rubber dam off, got the patient to buy, I'd spend another half an hour cutting it all back. And I, again, on the course, I always share a story about seeing some of the archive pictures on my hard disk. And there was a tooth with like eight cusps on it. And I was thinking, what on earth was I like <laughs> doing? So sort of making things up, you know, and I got to a point where at the end of my third year postgrad, I was feeling the financial pressures. I was feeling drained. I was feeling mentally like challenged. It was all becoming too much because I was in debt. I was running late every single time for no reason. My work wasn't good. Especially if it was maybe an endo or a, or a composite because you're trying to exert yourself and then you try to yeah. do all your wonderful anatomy, level up, portfolio building, that kind of stuff. And, and then yeah, it ends up being running late. It happens. Exactly. And it was just catching up. And at the time I thought, you know what, I'm going to call it a day. There was one instrument that we used with Lewis McKenzie in fifth year, which was the Style Italiano Visora made by LMRte, And it was this like fluorescent green with a really nice pointy edge. And I was fascinated by this instrument, believe it or not. And that was the sole reason why I Googled Style Italiano. And I thought, you know what, this looks like a nice course. It's in a beautiful setting in Italy on the coast. Can't go wrong. Let's go for a holiday. And then I'll come back, hand in my notice and do chefing or something like that. I was ready to quit so dentistry. This was actually. like the, the last supper for you. This was like, okay, let me just go out with a bash. Let me just do a tax deductible course somewhere. And then maybe I yeah. won't have to look at teeth ever again. Yeah, exactly that. Seriously. <laughs> like, it's, it's amazing how things work. I got there day one. I was like, you know what? It doesn't really matter. But I just want to see how amazing, like, why are these guys so amazing and stuff. And I sat through the, the talks and then I did the hands on and I, Every day, it was a four-day course, and I was thinking, my God, like, my work looks really good, and it hasn't taken as much time as I thought it would. And they're showing me 10-year, 20-year, 30-year follow-ups. Like, okay, this is the recipe to success, because it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It doesn't have to have every single detail that God created, because no matter what we do, we will never be God. And actually, it looks... 99.9% be better than anything I've ever done. Let's give it a go. So I thought, you know what? I'll give it a go. The first month I was practicing the techniques and I was thinking, my God, this is so crazy. I was becoming proficient, efficient, profitable. And I just thought this can't be true because this isn't what we were taught at university, but somehow it works. And, and it was that phrase, there was a phrase they used in the lecture, which was, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication which is something that da vinci quoted and it blew my mind it really is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication because instead of using everything that you know and trying to put everything that you know in one thing and just taking everything that works from those steps and applying it you've not only cut out the steps but you've cut out the mistakes you've cut out mm. the voids you've cut out the risk of making a mistake because the more steps you add, the higher the chances you make a mistake and the confusion with your team. Because again, if you don't have the same staff member 
or they're sick or they're away or you work in a different site, you have to be able to relay that information very easily, very proficiently, without confusion to your partner, essentially, in work. And it just made everything so much easier. And with that ease, all the other things fell into place. Efficiency, proficiency, profitability. And they have this really nice uh, motto. Industry should be feasible, teachable, and repeatable. Mm -hmm. And then profitable, because it, mm -hmm. you, know, you need to make a living. Absolutely. But those three things, feasible, teachable, repeatable. Uh -huh. And if you can get those three things with anything you do, you'll be successful. With your patients, I, I, with your I, I staff, see, with yourself. I, I see where all they, they all come from. But the, the teachable one, I've been reflecting on this because you're in education, I'm in education, right? We, we know I've been reflecting a lot about this. And I think that maybe that even that teachable one, we should change that word. I know where it comes from. I think we all know where it comes from and, and the reason behind it. But I think a better term might even be learnable. Yes. You know, teachable is more in the teacher perspective. I think learnable is in the, in the, in the learner's perspective. Yeah. So, if you, again, if you look at the learning pyramid, You'll see that 5% of knowledge is retained by reading or going to a lecture. But 90% of your knowledge is retained when you can teach that thing to somebody else. That's the golden nugget right there. Mm -hmm. Not the lecture, not uh, the audios, not the rewriting of the lecture, but being able to relay that information to somebody else. That's when you know you've got 90% of the information in your head. I, I'm a big fan of encouraging young dentists to, to go on courses and then the next week, obviously getting to implement it, but just arrange a meeting with the other associates in practice. So whenever you book a, a big course, right, that you've been looking forward to, just tell your work colleagues, hey guys, I'm going on this course. The week after, on the Thursday, when we usually have a dentist meeting, can we just make it about everything I learned on this course? How wonderful would it be for that individual who went on that course to share everything right, to really harness the power of the learning, right, and really cement it in place, and then to also Thank spread you. some joy and knowledge and efficiency. So I think that's, that's going to be the protrusive down pearl for this episode. There we are. To start sharing, because that's the highest uh, form of learning. And just like you said, I think this, this is where the magic really happens. So when you actually, you know, came away from Italy with that technique, and you've been using it in place, and just tell us about the beauty of the term. So, so at that point, was it fast modeling technique as we know it? Or is it, was yeah. it already called espresso? Just tell us about the evolution of that before we then describe one example scenario sure it was actually in 2014 when professor lewis hardan a professor of saint joseph university in lebanon and uh, dr murad akinov from azerbaijan they actually came up with the technique the fast modeling technique and what they did is they published a paper in polymers i can't remember the impact factor but it was quite a high impact factor for for the study they did and they showed a one year follow up using a bulk fill material and the technique which was fast modeling technique and i think you can just type in uh, fast modeling technique polymers and we'll, we'll put it in the show notes and the downloads yeah mm. Patrice Ranti, just interfering here with an update about Nafisa. You know Nafisa is a girl who's the daughter of one of our own. One of our own, Patrice Ranti, her name is Sakina, and her daughter Nafisa needs our help. She's got SMA type 1. Now, I made a really important video talking all about its condition. And if you want to see that, it's on our Instagram, at Protrusive Dental. But essentially, we're against the clock here. We don't have much time. We need your donations to help save her life. Even if it's just something like a hundred dollars, that would honestly go so far to getting to that one million dollar mark, so that actually they can start the therapy and save her life, and then they have a whole eight hundred thousand dollars still to pay from installments, which I'm hoping we can catch up to as well. But they're basically at eight hundred sixty thousand dollars at the time of recording this, which is spectacular. But we're not there yet. We really want to save Nafisa's life. So don't hear it from me. I'm going to play this one minute video of Sakina's plea. Hello, Prutus Ratis. My name is Dr. Sakina Isaji. I'm from Dar Salaam, Tanzania. I'm so grateful for Dr. Das for giving me this platform. I never thought I could ever get here, at least not for this. Today I'm here to fight for my daughter's life. My beautiful daughter who has a rare genetic disease called spinal muscular atrophy type 1. We have been fundraising for her. We have raised $840,000 so far and we still need about $1 million to get her treated on time. I urge you all, if all dentists can come together to join this cause, we could save her on time. I believe every life is worth saving. Please help me save my daughter.
Patrice Rati, you've been following my newsletters. I've been emailing you as well. And every newsletter I, I talk about Nafisa and how you can donate. So please go ahead to one of my old emails and then click the link to donate. Or just head over to protrusive.co.uk forward slash Nafisa, N-A-F-I-S-A. That's her name. Now, when you get there, it's like a, a Canadian fundraising page for Nafisa, which actually feeds into the main fundraising. So the, the amount you see might be over 200,000 Canadian, Canadian dollars, but don't worry, this is still legit. This is still the same cause for Nafisa. I'm hoping that we can all club together and help one of our own. Thank you. Anyways, it goes through that, and it showed that actually it was not only more predictable to do, but the results versus the traditional layer by layer or increment by increment this this was on that level if not better and why that's important is as we already mentioned if you're able to implement a material or use a material in a bulk filled manner doing all the other things first which we'll talk about in a minute but and, and be able to place a single shot of material in one go and then carve it out not only do you eliminate the risk of voids air bubbles all that stuff but when you actually do the cutting because you can essentially erase everything and start again you can actually get much better cusp formations and anatomy overall without making the mistake of building a cusp maybe overbuilding it or underbuilding it and then having to go around that by building all the other cusps or go back and cut mm. it's a really nice way if you've got one single mass you can build everything up, check it before you cure. If you've got a mistake or something, essentially erase it or erase that part and redo it without the risk of having a problem later on. So now, more recently, just to I mean, unify the term. Actually, I, mean, if oh, you're sorry, I was actually recording with the, the Bioclay guys yesterday. And so very similar uh -huh. concepts. So, you know, of essentially over contouring and being reductive. Right. Is it a fair way to, to describe it? Uh, I would say that not really overbuilding. No, it would be more following reading the tooth. So you would build a mass, let's say four mils. It depends on how deep your cavity is. But even if you're using a bulk fill, we do say use bulk fills cure up to six millimeters and they cure from the base to the top. That's how their particles are made to work. We would never do six mils. We would do maximum four. So depending on the, the depth of your cavity, if it's just say five, you do a two mil first and your final three or a three and then your final two. Nothing less than 1.5 essentially. Mm. But let's say you got a four mil cavity. Once you've treated the cavity and little things that you have to do beforehand. But imagine when you put a single shot of composite in one go, you are eliminating the risks of voids, bubbles, yep. things like that, because you've got less tampering with the composite. That's the advantage of the technique. Then when you're cutting the composite, you're reducing the shrinkage stress anyway, because you're cutting each cusp at a time. And oh, I, I, okay. This is where I got confused. This is yeah. the beauty of me. I'm, I'm glad I didn't read up on it before I spoke to you because this is me now in the same mindset of someone listening to this for the first time, right? So when you said cutting, I thought you meant like once it's cured, you get a burr and you cut back. That's what I thought. Oh, no, but no. actually, yes, what you mean is using that fissure instrument or similar and actually yes. okay, doing the magic bit, which I can now visualize, but you're going to explain shortly. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. I'm now yeah. in a happy place. Okay, good. So, so let's go <laughs> with that. Now. So that's why I thought it was reductive. You see, okay, now it makes sense. I think the best way to approach now is let's just talk through a scenario. The scenario is a lower right first molar. It's a leaking distal occlusal amalgam restoration. Classic. Okay. Uh, it is, for the sake of covering all bases, it is going to be a five and a half millimeter depth cavity. Okay. And yeah. it is uh, just very slightly subgingival. It's a little bit tricky, but uh, you're isolated and everything. In fact, let's not even talk about isolation. Let's talk about, you know, is there, you anesthetize, and then go from there. Just, I want to know your exact step-by-step -step, uh, sequence, every geeky goodness, and I'll probe you various stages. So actually, it starts with the, ra with the radiograph, first and foremost. So reading the radiograph before you start, that gives you all the clues or most of the clues as to how to approach the treatment. I like to use the power of three. Supragingival, subgingival, crystal. If it's supragingival, easy. You don't need to consider gingivectomy, crown lengthening or whatever. A wedge and a rubber dam does the trick. If it's subgingival, you might have to do gingivectomy. You might have to use a bigger wedge or you might have to do some form of uh, non-surgical uh, crown lengthening. And if it's crystal, obviously, you might have to pick up a blade or do crown lengthening before do anything else. So... We start with that first and then we move on. Now, the scenario that you've mentioned is subgingival. Again, if it's subgingival but not crystal, then usually I'll just place the rubber dam. So once I've, I've anesthetized, the rubber dam goes on. I like to do 
a quadrant isolation. So whether I'm doing one tooth or three teeth, I'll isolate from the distalmost tooth to the central incisor. If they've got a retainer, then it will be distalmost tooth to the four or five, and then the opposite five, again, just to retract the rubber dam in a way that you can visualize the whole area. So and it's, it's more split, comfortable it's split down. The so between the retainer part, it's split down. Or no, you just do, let's Mask say, seven to four, so seven, six, five, four, and then four. Got it. it pulls the and rubber dam just, uh, just uh, uh, hide, hide over the incisors, basically. Exactly, exactly. Right. And reduce the risk of saliva creeping in and stuff like that. And then the next question is to pre-wedge or not to pre-wedge. That is the question. So depending on where the, the cavity is, you would either pre-wedge or not pre-wedge. Now, when you wouldn't pre-wedge is if you've already got a broken contact and you've got, I don't know, sharp area or cutting area, obviously you probably want to remove that before you even try to the rubber dam even because you will tear the rubber dam as no matter how many rubber dams you go through so all of these things you have to think about before uh, the other trick i would say is take a piece of floss and if it goes through and it keeps breaking then you know that your rubber dam is going to probably tear and break so you might be better off cutting the cavity before you put a rubber dam on and then putting on the rubber dam to do the next steps but let's say that's fine then pre-wedge and choose the right wedge again there's a fantastic article on the star italiano website called mind the wedge by dr giuseppe chiodora and it basically goes through everything about wedging like from wooden plastic silicon cutting wedges customizing the whole shebang free so not to bore them about wedges we, we, but we will add that on because uh, we all <laughs> like a bit of info i mean nowadays i'm getting a lot of wedge lists because i'm using certain matrices that that you know negate the need for that which is great but uh, yeah, i mean i'm okay. still wedging 30 40 percent of the time uh, especially when i'm using my sectionals and uh, uh, the, the circus yeah. and the the trial and error and the trials and tribulations but when you learn a bit more get more experience you know which yeah. wedge to use and which scenario how to modify the wedge exactly. and when to use a diamond wedge all these little nuances that we love in restorative dentistry exactly and then i would cut my cavity now this is a, a very important thing when it comes to restorative uh, one thing that we're taught at university and i appreciate and i think we should have respect but not to be too biased down by is minimally invasive dentistry now the term minimally invasive dentistry doesn't mean to be highly stupid dentistry so what i mean by that is that when we cut a cavity we have to think about why are we actually cutting the cavity in the first place because primarily the patient isn't cleaning it if the patient can't clean it what makes us think that if we remove just that part of the cavity and restore it again that the patient's going to be able to clean it so we've got to ensure that the cavity is cleansable by the patient first and foremost and secondly if it's hard for the patient to clean it's going to be hard for us to restore the smaller it is the more difficult it is to place a matrix, to place a wedge, and more importantly, to place your material. So uh, one thing that Walter Devoto told me, again, on the course, was to be conservative is not to be stupid. Probably print those phrases out and put them on every single dental school entrance, because that has changed my life, really. Why not use the word optimally invasive rather than minimally invasive? So to be optimally invasive means two things or three things. One, the patient can clean it, whether they brush twice a day, 10 times a day or no times a day. It's, you know, it's more cleansable. Two, it means it's easier for us to restore. And if it's easier for us to restore in a class two setting where the most important part of the whole restoration is that class two wall if you've got a leak there if you've got a problem there it doesn't matter what you do after that it's a failing restoration so we are able to be more predictable to treat that part and therefore the success of our restorative uh, treatment is higher and that's how you win your patients that's how you gain your colleagues trust and that's how you build your rapport and confidence as well because the last thing you want to do is think in your head oh, i'm a really invasive dentist but the patients come back with a second round of caries in the same spot there's a problem there then you're going to cut even more of the tooth away so you've got to be smart with your cavity design so flare it make sure that it's accessible by the patient with a toothbrush more importantly then you move on to the next bit which is matrix before you cover then before we cover matrix i just want to give a few reflections on you know total sense you're talking when we're being minimally invasive lincoln harris taught me that you know minimally invasive is a is not a goal it's a modifying factor the goal yeah. is like you said to get a cleansable restoration in someone who may be more caries prone and therefore you can't be the goal can't be minimally invasive because if we do that then it won't become cleansable so we have to remember that that's a 
modifying factor. It's not a goal. Sometimes we have to remember that the matrices that we're working with, and you're going to cover this, obviously, we have to design our cavities to accommodate our matrix. Because if you don't design the cavity well, and then you get a kink in the matrix, then you're not using the matrix how it's designed to be used. We sometimes need to be a little bit slightly more invasive to allow the passivity or the, the correct functioning of the matrix the way it was designed. And, and so that's really important. And, and the last thing there is the struggles of a claustrophobic class two, right? We hate doing these claustrophobic class twos. And so having more space is just going to reduce your stress massively and actually makes you achieve a better outcome. So I totally echo everything you said there. So please tell us about major seeing, but I'm really excited to get to the actual uh, bit where the, the espresso technique actually comes to <laughs> place. But by the way, the, what you're saying, please continue because I think we're getting so much value from, because you're not only just giving us a protocol, you're giving us the why and the reason. So I'm really enjoying this so far. Please keep going. Thank you. Uh, so now it comes to the matrixing part which again a lot of people have quite a lot of stress about or confusion unfortunately to this day there isn't one matrix system fits all uh, so you might have to have two different matrix systems in your practice to kind of cover everything there are some maybe a ring coming out which might cater for everything but for now, I'm not allowed to talk about it. What a tease. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but if you had to choose two, I would say the polydentia system and the paladent system works very well, or polydentia and garrison compatite. Or I've never used the bioclear system myself personally, but mm. I'm sure use the system that you're familiar with and that you're comfortable with, is what I would say. And if you're not sure, if you don't know, then obviously go on a course and try it out or see your colleague and see how they do things and go from there. But I, let's no just say having, I mean, you know, yeah. six different matrix systems, like, you know, as a no. practice, as a business, you know, so it may be that, you know, if you want to do bike, go on the bike, course and embrace their philosophy. And then, you know, 10, 20 percent time, you just have to have the other backup matrix for the other scenarios where it may, may not cater for it. Or if you're going to mm -hmm. go all into polydentia and, and then have the other, you know, I agree, not one matrix, but uh, two, three systems max that mm -hmm. you have in the practice. And that is going to be enough. But I totally agree. There's no one matrix matrix that's going to be optimal in every scenario yeah exactly now the question about pre-wedging or not pre-wedging the advantages let's say of pre-wedging are the most obvious which is separation of the teeth uh, again when you're using rubber dam you will get some separation of the teeth from the rubber dam itself but obviously, the more separation you do, or the earlier the separation you do, the higher the chance you have of actually moving those two teeth away from each other and reducing the risk of iatrogenic damage. The second important thing with pre-wedging is, again, in a deep cavity, uh, the longer the wedge is in that sulcus for, the higher the chance or the, the more that the gingiva is depressed by the wedge, which means that if you've depressed the gingiva over that time, you're going to access that cavity much more predictably than you would if you then saw, oops, I've got a slightly deeper cavity now, now let me put the wedge in. The risk of then putting the wedge in, not pre-wedging, is that you might tear your dam, you might have some bleeding if you've been cutting the burr and you've accidentally slipped and you, you've shredded the, the rubber dam itself there's so many little things that can happen along the way so again if you're not sure my advice would be pre-cut your class two before you put the dam on and then wedge and uh, dam and wedge uh, and go ahead if you're definitely sure based on your x-ray that you're clear of the gingival margins then pre-wedge is, is what i would do Mm -hmm. And then I would check my cavity, make sure that I have no undermined enamel. Uh, this is another thing, a bit controversial, but again, if we think about it logically, a lot of the time when we are doing the class two cavity preparation, we end up with a very thin amount of enamel. And what I used to do even before I, uh, I was taught this way is I would take ultrasonic and whiz it all away. Or I would take a thing, a chisel, and chisel it all away. And if you think about it, you've just removed the best bonding material that you've got in that space. So unless it's like completely thin and you can see it's all cracked and broken apart, try to preserve that extremely precious bit of enamel there. And what you can do before you remove your wedge, or if you've not wedged, it's more even, it's better if you haven't wedged, is reinforcing just that part 
with a, a drop of flowable and making it strong enough to put a wedge in and then do your matrixing in your class too. So there's a little bit of talking about that. I don't want to confuse the audience, but this is maybe for a course, but let's just ignore it. And let's say we've got perfect enamel and everything is, is lovely. You put your wedge in or you take your wedge out, sorry, you check your cavities clean before you put your ring or your matrix. You want to clean the cavity or a final clean with the AquaCare if you've got it or even a sandblaster. If you're using a sandblaster, just be careful. You're not too zealous with the button because then the patient turns into a snowman. And a trick is just if you get a piece of gauze and you wet the gauze and you place it over, then it will kind of soak up a lot of that sand if you don't have an aqua care. But if you have an aqua care, just run it around your cavity. I also like to use a greenie just on the periphery of the cavity preparation. Again, almost like beveling the enamel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that will give you a much better integration of composite and also it will strengthen the composite in that area often when you see the shrinkage stress or you see composites after eight seven years whatever you'll see that white sort of uh, dark ring around and that's because there's not enough of a bevel let's say in that area mm -hmm. so it's a little bevel around and then you're ready for bonding now depending on the cavity space the interproximal space I'll either put my sectional matrix in the right direction or if I want to bond and I, I haven't got a lot of space, I'll turn it the other way around so that I don't have bond on my matrix. Because, okay. again, what happens is you end up with a pool of bond and once you cure it, you've got now half a mil of bond or if you're using OptiBond FL, you've got a millimetre of bond and then you've got your composite and... If you take a post-op x-ray or you take an x-ray in a couple of years or whatever, you think it's a void or someone else thinks it's a void. So yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's better. It's like an open margin almost. Exactly. So you've got to be, mm -hmm. just be careful of those little things, again, depending on the bond system that you use. Now, if you so, ask me I how I, I, I do it. I didn't quite get that. But I didn't quite get that bit though. So, so what's the tip here in terms of reversing the matrix? So, yeah. so, so basically you, instead of using it as you normally do, you just for a moment, turn it the other way around. And, and yeah. how does that actually prevent the pooling of the bond in, in that area? So it, it doesn't prevent pooling of, of the bond, but it prevents the bond sticking onto the bit of the matrix that you're then going to use to, to pack your composite against. Got it. So for that part, and then again, regarding the pooling, what you want to do is you want to leave the bond for a minute or so just to naturally be absorbed by the tooth. And then if you've got a good three in one, go around it gently, check it on your neck or your arm first to make sure there's no water uh, or use the suction tip on sort of a halfway suction just to remove any solvent. Now, we missed a bit about etching, which I'll just quickly go for, go through. I do selective enamel etch only. And that's because I'm using a universal bonding system. So going back to the easing and the predictability, let me just tell you one thing, guys. These companies, it's in their best interest to give us the best material. Because if it doesn't work, we won't buy it. And if we don't buy it, they don't make any money and they don't make any more product. I've been to the labs. I've been to the companies where they make these things. And if you think we're OCD about doing fissures and dentistry. Trust me when I tell you, the biomaterial scientists are the worst OCD people you can come across. They care a lot about what they produce. So just to give you an example, Universal Bond, they attached a, a car and they lifted a car with Universal Bond. So if you use the bond according to the manufacturer's instructions, which is Amen. very important, then the bond will give you exactly what the manufacturer promised, which is a good bonding, a, a strong bond, and you have no problems. You, have, you can sleep at night. Mm -hmm. This was another factor, actually, that changed my life because prior to that, I was etching dentine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you've got a stop clock and you've got the most incredible reflexes and your nurse is on on the ball every time you cannot tell me that you're etching dentine for 20 seconds or 15 seconds or 10 seconds there is no way never no matter how good you are so what and happens and is if you've taken a photo of your etching the dentine you over etched exactly exactly <laughs> so like one of the main things that we have is uh, people say oh post-op sensitivity 
mainly because that dentine is being overetched. And when you overetch dentine, it means that you have a higher chance of over drying it. And then there's an argument of people saying, oh, but you can then re-wet it. Okay, I tried to re-wet it, but at the same time, I've now wet my enamel. Okay, I'll re-dry it. And then I've over-dried my dentine. And now, so you're going backwards and forwards. And okay, let me use the primer. Let me use this bottle. And then the, the nurse gives you the wrong bottle because you've got three bottles out already. And you've got a, <laughs> a gloomer here. You've got a primer there. You've got an A and B one. One's blue, one's white but there's another blue one from a different thing. It's so confusing. So having a simplified workflow makes it much easier to do your work. Now, I'm not saying if you're using a two-step system or whatever, use it. And if you're happy with it, I have no issues at all. They all work brilliantly if you use them to their instructions. But I'm just talking about me. Mm-hmm. So I selectively etch the enamel. And another little tip, When you etch enamel, what often happens is people etch the bit that isn't really necessary. So they etch the top of the enamel and they forget about the inner part of the enamel, which is where you want your enamel to be etched, really, Mm -hmm. because that's where you want your bond. So So let's say, you know, that's where the issue could happen more by the fissures they're etching. But that enamel there might be, you know, one and a half, two millimeters thick. And then the the bit where by the ADJ, they've missed that enamel there, right? Exactly. And that's a crucial enamel because... That's where you want your bonding to be Mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that we find with etching is that you press and it goes all over the place. So another tip, just like you do with your air, just extrude your etchant first on on a bracket table or or on a piece of tissue or something. Make sure you've got a nice, smooth, consistent flow. Or what I tend to do now is I extrude it onto a little pad and I'll use the fissura and to run it across my enamel because... I don't want to risk an accident and whatever. So Mm I have a lot more control. So enamel etch only, uh, 30 seconds, wash it for 30 to 60 seconds. Now, this is also very important. When you're not timing 30 seconds, it seems like two seconds. So if you think about 30 seconds, you might just do five. If you time 30 seconds, it's a long time. It's a very long time. So time 30 seconds at least and why i say that is because one of the byproducts of etching is salts and now if you don't wash those salts properly you've got salts that are then playing around with your bonding so what we're talking about is important if you want to get optimal bonding and that's what we all want to do so again based on manufacturers we need to make sure we follow their instructions in order to get the best out of the products that we're using but sometimes on a course i say to people what bond are you using and they'll be like the black bottle (laughs) <laughs> but which one is it what this do you use patients, i don't know uh, when we ask them what medicine they're having they're saying oh yeah uh, that purple pill or the blue pill or whatever you know like how does that help you <laughs> uh, and, and this is really important jazz because like guys if you're using something especially on a patient and you don't know what it is you're using so how do you know how you're using it or how you're supposed to using use it 100%. and then how do you know what you're doing is actually going to be uh, proper and 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 right so uh, it's our duty to understand or at least know what we are giving the patients like you said it would be like prescribing amoxicillin to someone who's allergic to penicillin it doesn't make sense so you've Mm -hmm. got to know what you're using before you actually do it on a patient not just oh it's the black bottle that was in the drawer or that the nurse gave to me that's where all the voids and mistakes and problems arise from us not knowing what we're using and how we, we should use it. So this is really important. I wonder, Ahmed, if you've ever done this uh, experiment on one of your courses, whereby you will ask your cohort how many of you etch dentine, and then you see the number of hands go up, right? And you should, maybe if you haven't done this before, do it and do it the next one, right? And then you ask them all which bond they're using, and for those that know, and then you know actually part of the protocol of that bond is that you shouldn't be etching the dentine. It's like someone messaged me once saying, oh, my, my paracord kept falling away. Well, like, did you, and you know, well, tell me your protocol. And then I looked at that bit where they said, yes, I etched dentine. I was like, well, did you know that for the paracord protocol, you, you don't etch dentine? Uh, and so people, they, when they migrate from the earlier bonds to the more universal ones, because they've always etched dentine from dental school, 
They yeah. continue to etch dentine, and therefore yeah. that's completely uh, diminishing the bond strength of dentine by etching it. So if anyone's multitasking, they missed they miss that. This is probably extremely important, game-changing, simple thing that you probably are sure of knew. You might be embarrassed, but there will, be, there will be some dentists out there thinking, holy moly, I can't believe I've been etching dentine when I shouldn't have been etching dentine. And so it's really important just to <laughs> emphasize that. As you say, on the courses, we do. It, we do say that it's amazing. But yeah, the, like jokes aside, this is really important. Now we come to the bond. So as we said, I use a universal bond. Important to try and avoid overpooling, especially in the class two area. A couple of things like we already mentioned. Uh, so leaving it just to naturally absorb and for the solvent to evaporate or using a three in one, gently making sure there's no water, using uh, suction on halfway. Uh, the other thing I like to use is I'll take a, a clean a small micro brush and I'll just run it along the pool. And then before I cure, I remove the matrix. So you see how we, we turned it the other way, not the way that we're going to restore. Mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. again, so that it doesn't stick on to the bit that we want to place the composite on. I remove the matrix, the sectional matrix, and then I, I check one more time for any pooling. Then I place the matrix the right way around, and then I do you, cure. How do you manage this uh, in cases whereby you're a little bit deeper, and uh, so sometimes you might disturb? Like I, I imagine removing the matrix fine, but when you're reinserting that matrix, if there was a tight formation with the with the wedge, is do you have to then you know uh, loosen your wedge a bit to then uh, reinsert it to, to try and get that uh, readaptation? That, or if you're not comfortable with that, again, this depends on your skill set and how yes. experienced you are of that but let's just say we're all beginners right now put the matrix the right way around do your bonding as you would and then just use a micro brush or two mm -hmm. just to remove the pooling of bonding in that area make sure you haven't got any going up the sides of the matrix as well cause that's kind of that can affect your restoration also uh, and then just make sure give it another look I hope everyone uses loops, but just check everything and then give it a cure. Now, with curing, again, also extremely important. Know what curing light you are using. And if you're working in a place where you don't know what the curing light you're using is, I would recommend you purchase your own one. And I know that can be a very expensive thing to do, but ATEETH, the company, have now been able to provide us all with the most incredible curing pen for the most astonishing price ever. So with the price of a cure pen, I think is 180 pounds. Wow. I mean, it's incredible. It has five functions. It has a detection mode. It does high intensity curing, like 2,400, whatever. And I've checked it on the reader and it is exactly what it says. It's just above what it says, actually. So if you haven't I, got I'd the right the curing name, unit, but I didn't know about the incredible amazing. value that. That's amazing. I will definitely put a link there. And thank you for promoting another company and, and helping this like you'll get get known more. That's great. I think this will be a oh, good Oh, sorry, I wasn't, meaning, I wasn't meaning to, to, no, to no, plug No, no, I know, but that's, but that's good. That's genuinely... good, good materials, good value always has a place. I'm, you know, I'm not biased towards any one system. I'm always happy to hear them all. So that's great. I think it was cheaper before it became famous, but really good light unit. And I've got like four of them. So why that's important is because, again, if you've got the wrong frequency of light, your bond isn't being cured, and more importantly, your composite isn't being cured. And if those things are not done correctly, your restoration is going to fail, mm -hmm. or is failing as we speak. So curing time, again, I just have a rule, depending on the on manufacturer's instructions, but I do a minimum of 40 seconds. I prefer 60 seconds on the first cure. Regardless, you can't over cure something. Another tip that I personally do, especially in the extremely deep cavities, and this is just, there's no science, it's just something that I once thought about. If you place a cure cl quite close to your fingers or your nails, you feel that it gets quite hot. So for me in deep cavities, I, I know it probably does nothing, but I just worry. So I'll use the three in one air from a distance and I'll just blow air whilst it's curing just so that the tooth isn't mm -hmm. getting too hot. Cooling, cooling. So simultaneous cooling. Cooling. Yeah, but, but this is just Ahmed's thing. It's not, sure. there's no science, but it's a little tip if you want to use it. So 60 seconds, first cure. And now the final layer of adhesive is not adhesive. It's your flowable composite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we've bonded our tooth. And the final adhesive layer, this is important. The final adhesive layer is the high filled 
low shrinkage stress flowable composite. Nothing of those cheapy ones like minimally filled. It has to be a good reputable flowable composite. Genial, and I go around that kind of stuff. Or genial we... flow. So I can give you the list. Genial flow, uh, 3M bulk fill flow. My personal favorite, Majesty Aesthetic Flow and Kerr Bulk Fill Flow. And there's one more that's really good. He said GC, yeah. So any of those is excellent. Highly filled, reputable brands. And yeah, you've got enough filler content and low shrinkage stress. But mm -hmm. the key here is that we are placing this flowable along and against all of the dentine. So if you want to call it or make it easier, it's like we're doing an immediate dentine seal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No more than 0.5 millimeters. So again, if you want to make it simple for you for yourself, I just use the flow. I, I'll inject a little bit in the middle and then I'll use like a ball ended probe or a BP probe or fissura or whatever and run my flowable against the dentine part of my cavity. Make sure you get the walls, make sure you get the base, very important. Again, what that does, is it gives you a nice flat base and it seals your dentine layer and it secures your bonding layer, which is what we want to do in this technique. We want to secure that bonding layer. Mm -hmm. Be careful not to go into the interproximal space, okay? Now, if you even leave a little bit because you're scared to go into a proximal, leave, leave a little bit. You don't have to go all the way. And I'll explain why in a minute. That's my final adhesive layer. A flowable composite to secure my adhesive, my adhesive layer and then cure it again for 40 seconds. Now we can move on to converting the class 2 to a class 1. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, should, this is. Should I carry on? I don't do this. Yeah, please. I don't do this at the moment. So, very Thank interesting. It, it, essentially, you've described an immediate dentine sealing, which is which is great. I'm really enjoying this because this is something that's new to me in restorative. Obviously, I do IDS for my overlays and stuff. Uh, the, the kind of concept that you describe very nicely. Uh, you. Definitely got me interested for the, for the next steps. Uh, the next step, I think you're going to be the marginal ridge, quite classic. Is that, is that right? Yes. So the marginal ridge, two things here in, a, in converting the class two to class one that I was struggling with personally. But also, how do we make sure that those little nitty gritty areas are perfectly sealed? It's impossible to tell, right? There's no way of telling un unless you extract the tooth. <laughs> so... What other ways are there that we can use to increase the chances of ensuring those areas are sealed? Because like endo, with restorative also, the seal is the deal. So what I do now is I place another bit of flowable right at the junction of my matrix and tooth, and I run along with my fissura or my probe, and I, I run that flowable along the base where the, the matrix junction, meets the tooth. The, yeah, the base. The base where the matrix meets the tooth. And then I take my paste composite. Mm -hmm. Heated? I haven't cured yet. You can heat it if it's if it's uh, if it can be heated. So you need to check it is heatable because not mm -hmm. all composites are. But yeah, however you choose to, to go. Mm -hmm. And I like to personally use compules here in the gun. Make sure you squeeze a little bit out, check that it's a clean bit of composite that hasn't been you know in the cupboard or no lid and there's dust particles or something so if you're not sure just remove that 0.5 or one mil out and now you take the gun remember we have not cured that flowable composite in the in the space yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uncured we place the paste flowable, the same flowable that you used earlier for the ids type exactly thing, the uh, same yep. mm -hmm. exactly the same and now it's called the snowplow technique yes and now you this place what I do your well. You place your composite as deep as you can, or the, the tip of the, the, and you push in one motion, again, just one motion, try not to be, just one motion gently and almost build your wall, okay? Now, you want to take a condenser or whatever you usually use to pack your, your I use the LM condenser or the Solo, the other tip, and I pack from the base to the top, not from the top to the bottom. Because what happens is if you concentrate on the top, you'll forget about the most important part, which is the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then you'll cure and then you won't know that you have a void until you find out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So always concentrate on the bits that you cannot see later on, mm -hmm. which is the base. 
So now I want to condense and pack my composite against my matrix. S take your time, slowly, pack, pack, pack. Make sure it's nice, even, uh, nothing more than one mil, preferably half if you can, but one mil is fine. And then before I cure, I I'll use my, my micro brush and again, dap around the base, and make sure it's a nice smooth wall, okay? Now you're probably asking, what do I do with the excess that I have on the marginal the ridge height? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do I fix the coronal part? Which again was the, the most annoying thing for me at the start, because how do you get that right? You can eyeball it, but you might underdo it or overdo it. Now, if you underdo it, you've got a risk of having an open contact or no contact with the patient. If you overdo it, you risk overdoing the rest of your restoration and then having to cut everything back mm -hmm. once you take the, the, the dam off. So again, the genius who is Professor Lewis Hardan, he actually invented an instrument called the posterior mesura, again from mm -hmm. LM yes. Arte. I've got this. And it has two, two parts. One part is a calibrated uh, 1.5 millimeter to make your cusps if you're doing two layers. But the most important part is the uh, fork, which has two same side ends and you place the fork over the matrix and what you do is you run it along the matrix and the opposing tooth because you've got the height of the adjacent yeah. tooth and what that does is because that's already a fixed height the instrument cannot go further down and therefore you get the exact height of the marginal ridge when you when you run it along and then again you just tidy up take a micro the micro brush i think is the most underrated instrument that we have in our cupboards it's used for everything. Uh, micro brush, just make sure everything nice and smooth. Remove any excess with a pointy probe or the fissura again. And then just double check one more time with your posterior mesura, and then you can cure. Now you can remove your uh, matrix. But again, because you're building up that wall in one go, I have, again, this is my, my thing. What I'll do is after my first cure, I will gently peel off the matrix and i have two like curing units i'll go on one side my nurse does the other side and we cure again in between to make sure that all of that composite is cured mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we then remove just the matrix band not leave the wedge, the wedge. Mm -hmm. leave the wedge behind remove the matrix and give it another 20 second cure with you and the nurse if you're lucky to have two curing units if not then do both falls again Listen, now you price got, of eight teeth, you can buy ten, all right, and then also be the same as a vendor. You can <laughs> it, it, exactly. No, th this is exactly my point. So now you've cured your wall, you've set your wall, you've converted the heart, you've done the hardest part of your restoration. Now, uh, now if you're late, if you're running late, or if you ended up with problems that you've had to, you know, focus on, like we said, cavity preparation, a subgingival cavity you weren't aware of, the wall took a little bit of time. There's no harm in putting a temporary cavit, whatever it is, uh, calzonol, and getting the patient back. No harm in doing that because you've done the hardest thing. Even, let's say, if you want to play Russian roulette with the pulp, that's another story for another day. But let's say you just want to make sure that it, you don't have any pulpal issues, put that t temp on and, and bring the patient another day. The next time they come, it will be the easiest restoration you ever do in your life. Because you've got that immediate dentin seal type layer already covering your dentin, exactly. protecting the, the pulp. You've got the contact, you've got the height correct, so the occlusion is not gonna, likely not going to be too proud at the marginal ridge area. So you've pretty exactly. much set yourself up for, for success. And, and this is, yeah. I'm sure you're going to say afterwards, that on reflection, if you do a percentage of the appointment, this is the most critical bit. And once you get to here, the next bit is the, is the espresso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, this is uh, to all the new, especially the new uh, dentists, new colleagues. Uh, what I, Ahmed, was interested in was the anatomy, more than the cavity, more than the design, more than the bonding, more than the class two. I would rush that so that I had more time to do the bit that is least important, which is anatomy. Anatomy should be the least important part of the whole restoration. It's important but it's not the most important, which is where you have to prioritize your work. And for me, I had my priorities all wrong. Mm -hmm. So now anatomy takes me the least amount of time. And the most important things for the success of my restoration takes me the right amount of time. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Well said. So you said it would be a five and a half millimeter cavity. So now I, I'm going to change it now, uh, only for the interest of time. Let's go for the four millimeter because okay, sure. I want I want to hear you do it in one shot, basically. Because I think we can always okay. you know go to your course or learn more, read more kind of thing to to learn the deeper bits. Sure. But uh, I'm amazed about how much ground we've covered. And I've enjoyed every second of it. Oh, Let's say it's you. a more standard three and a half four mil one. I want to hear you okay. do just a bit about the one shot and how that works because I think uh, the Patrice Rati are a clever bunch actually. I don't know a lot of new grads out there, but the, uh, the the guys following have heard all the different tips and tricks, and I, I think visualize about the doing it in two stages. But that ultimate the, the beauty of the technique you're talking about really comes in this next bit so let's talk about the, f- the four mil height fine so why the one shot so obviously this is a style italiano concept italians love coffee so this is why we've used espresso now in italian espresso not only means an espresso shot of coffee but it also means fast so it's one shot of coffee essentially so one shot of restoration and you're done so again you have to use the correct material so i'm using a bulk fill It can be any bulk film material from the reputable brands and you fill up that cavity all in one. So again, if you're using Compule, Compule to the base, one shot and fill up like you used to do with SDR Mm -hmm. a bit. Are you still now, doing snow plowing? Are are you still doing, I mean, uh, I tend to, but are you still adding a little bit flowable before you do this uh, one shot? No, no, now I'm not because now I've got everything ready. You can, if you want to, it does no harm, but I, I don't no okay no need and now you build up the cavity you can overbuild if you want which is fine and this is the crucial bit now using the correct instrument so i use the condenser and the visora or now we've got the posterior solo so um you were talking about the the, the one shot the, the actual uh, condensing part yeah so you've built up now you, you want to pack your composite so again like we did with the class two part we want to make sure we've packed it right into the to the base and we'll start getting some excess. Now the trick or the thing that everyone asks is how on earth do you then form the cusps and how do you get the inclinations? The most important thing here is to read the tooth. Uh, now, it, this is, of course, if the tooth has still got most of its details. We're not talking about a completely broken down tooth. Uh, if you angle the instrument, so let's say the posterior solo here, the LM posterior solo, you angle the instrument at the inclination of the cusp and you start to pack and spread your restoration following the inclination of the cusp. Now, if you do that, if you pack and spread along the inclination of each cusp, what you'll find is once you've removed the excess, which will come out as you do that, you'll almost have the primary anatomy of the tooth so like if you think about an anterior tooth you have the primary or the body of the tooth now you have the body of your posterior restoration you almost see where the fissures are going to be and depending on what tooth it is then you place your fissures or your central fosses uh, where they should be now again um just for the sake of um people visualizing let's just assume it's an upper six occlusal now um you want to find the central fossa mm-hmm. and you want to go in with your instrument and put your central fossa landmark into the composite mm-hmm. okay so how, it will just look like a pin drop all the way down if you want that's it that's because remember you're, you're all cutting the way. Hit, hit hit the ids layer that you made basically yeah you can yeah yeah you all the way down hit the ids layer and now come out so that's your center or i like to call it that's your home button that's mm-hmm. where you find the rest of your stuff now with an upper six you've got on the buckle aspect you've got where the mesial uh, buckle cusp and the distal buckle cusp meet you've got a junction you've got mm-hmm. a junction so it's at that junction where your central fossa and um your your junction meet so then it's almost like connecting that dot to that and that's where you separated the two cusps the buckle the mesial buckle and the distal buckle so how you separate you don't put your fissura and drag never drag just put in your central fissura and almost as if you're stitching go up and down and cut that composite until you meet your next point so you're cutting the composite and now if you imagine it from let's say the the traditional cusp by cusp point of view rather than have two different cusps at 
you know, at different points, you've made two cusps in one hit. Okay, and you do the rest for the other bits. And, and now, before you cure, you look back, you check with your mirror, and you assess. You check the proportions of the tooth, you check the proportions of the, the cusps, make sure that the fish is on the right place. And then I take a micro brush, because you might have a quite wide fishes now. Take a micro brush and gently start to narrow those fishes. So you're pushing the composite back in a little bit okay so and, and that's forming brush. like a like the, the, it's forming a fisher line so wh whilst you were cutting yeah. with the, the the pro black instrument you you got like a too wide of a fisher um like a, almost mm -hmm. like a gap you want to leave it you don't want to leave that yeah. gap. but then with the the, the, exactly. the micro brush you're, you're seaming them together and then you're having the, the the fisher line being formed um through through this way right exactly exactly that Hi guys, it's me again with an interference, really important one. I actually got a little bit confused here about the whole use of the micro brushes to close the fishes. And I didn't speak to him at the time, but I texted him later. I said, hmm, if you're closing the fishes with the micro brush, and, and essentially this kind of class one that you've made, all these fishes are now touching each other. What about the shrinkage stress? What about the C factor? So this is an important distinction that uh, Ahmed helped to clear up. Firstly, when you're using the micro brush, you're not actually closing the fishes all the way. You're actually leaving a bit of space for your bulk fill flowable again to go inside. So the micro brush isn't closing it. You're actually leaving that little bit of space, tiny space for the flowable. Now, he says that even if in some areas you do end up closing it or it ends up getting closed, firstly, you still have that, you know, the IDS type layer, the layer of adhesive covering the dentine everywhere. And also these bulk fill restorative materials are actually way less shrinkage stress than traditional flowables. So I'm, gl I'm glad I raised that with him and I'm just passing that on to you guys because I know that you are probably thinking the same thing, right? Anyway, you're doing really well to make it this far. I hope it's been worth it so far. Let's rejoin Ahmed for the last bit. Uh, and then once you're happy with the fisher line, however, however you want to form it, you then just double check and cure. Mm -hmm. Now that usually takes me, that last layer will take me no more than two minutes. Mm -hmm. Espresso. Hand, hand on heart. <laughs> Literally, as long as it takes for an espresso cup to be made, it, it takes about 30 seconds, really. Uh -uh. Now, uh, once you've done that, again, your audience might be wondering, so now we have these fishes, what do we do with these fishes? Should we leave them alone or do we seal them or what do we do? I personally seal them. That's again, hmm. my personal, some people argue you can leave them. Again, if you've been overzealous, I would discourage you from leaving them and seal them. So now you kind of want to do a fissure sealant with the same flowable that you've used for your base, for the IDS and for your snowplow, same one. You take the tip of the flowable if you want to, or you put it on the tip and you go for it. However you usually do a fissure sealant, do it. I just take an extra fine tip. I place it into my fishes and I and I squeeze it into the fishes to make sure that flowable really closes my fishes. Now you're probably wondering why on earth have you just created fishes and now you're closing them? This is the bit where you can either add some color, and I would call that characterizations, not stains, because patients don't like the term stain. So call it a characterization or a tint. Um, I, or I, I call it dental masturbation, but you can call it what you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lewis McKenzie, rest his, rest his soul. He oh, used to call it that too, actually. Okay, okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but yeah, so this is if you want to add some color uh, alongside that, it, it's the right time to do it. I personally wouldn't add the color without placing the flowable first for two reasons. One, the flowable is going to have a lot more uh, filler content, but also it gives you a pool of flowable that then you can use very minimal um, color composite rather than just have like almost like a pigeon poo stain. You know, you don't want it to be too much. The other thing that you have to do <laughs> before you do that is you have to remove the excess with a micro brush. So even if you feel like you've been very accurate, take a, a big micro brush now, a large size, and just run it along the tooth and remove all of the excess as much as you can. Then if you choose to put uh, some color you can if not that's fine the other thing I would say to to the listeners is that if the patient has color fine add color if their other teeth do not have color please do not add the color because they will see it and they will ask you what the hell is that so uh, use your sense yeah and then cure it again mm -hmm. uh, for 60 seconds uh, fine now very meticulous 
I am, I am. <laughs> now um, comes the, the next bit, which is, do I use glycerin and, and then do another uh, uh, cure or not? And now, remember, we've done a class two to a class one. So glycerine is important for the areas that we are unable to reach when we come to polishing. And ideally, you don't want to be taking any polishing strips into proximally. So you're not going to be able to polish that as you would like. And you shouldn't need to if you've followed all the steps correctly and you haven't tampered with your matrix and you haven't distorted it, etc. So here, I would add some glycerine and I would cure once again because you'll always have some uncured resin in the class two part. Whether you want to do that for occlusal is up to you. You don't have to, but again, I always say there's no harm in curing again. It's just an excuse to cure again. So there's no harm in doing so. And then um, we, we cure and the restoration is finished or so we think. Now we want to polish our restoration from the occlusal aspect. Now, again, at university, I was told you don't have to um, polish posteriors. Uh, I do for two reasons. The first thing is we're providing a service for the patient. The last thing you want to do is you want to spend all that time, take all that money from the patient, and then they rub their tongue along the, the surface and it feels like sandpaper. That's not very nice. Secondly, if you polish the composite restoration, you're going to also reduce the risk of these little rough bits detaching off the composite or pulling away from the composite, which may lead to the composite staining or ditching or uh, whatever, picking up cracks or failure over time. So you're going to have a much better long-term prognosis for the restoration. So please try to polish um, your restorations all the time. And I have a very you're simple working recipe. on the uh, occlusion before we just hear a protocol. Um, if you if you don't polish so well, and little little tiny bits of resin are just off axis on the on the cusp tip, that's what's actually throwing your yes. bite off. And only when you just take an, an Eve yes. twist pink or whatever, uh, then the bite suddenly feels perfect again. And so it, just that polishing just also helps you to actually properly check your uh, occlusion and not be little the tiny bits of resin off axis that are contributing to the the, the dodgy occlusion. Uh, you, you beat me to it, Jazz, but yeah, exactly. I was going to come to that uh, as well. But <laughs> <Sorry>. Exactly. <laughs> it, no, no, th this is beautiful because you're thinking the same. It, this is exactly, it, this is exactly why. Um, and there are some other little tricks that we, we'll go through, but it's not for, 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 for listening. You've got to see it. Um, but anyways, so Eve's uh, course and Eve's fine. And that's your restoration done. Now, um, Another thing that we didn't say before we start the restoration is I would encourage everyone to do a pre-operative occlusal check and take a picture. And here's why. Whether it's with your phone, with a camera, with the intraoral camera, whatever it is, just do a pre-operative occlusal articulation check before you start this whole process for two reasons. The first one is most of the time you're going to numb the patient up. Whenever the patient is numb, they're going to feel disorientated. They don't feel that they can bite correctly. Everything is a mess. Secondly, they'll have their mouth open, whether it's an hour or two hours. It's a long time. So they're tired, their jaw hurts, and they'll always say to you, oh, it doesn't feel right, or I don't really know. So if you've got a preoperative occlusal check and a postoperative occlusal check, not only are you able then to reassure yourself and the patient um, that, you know, everything should be fine once everything clears and settles. So it's, it's a reassurance for us because if we don't have that reference point, we're going to be inclined to remove contacts that shouldn't be removed because we don't have a reference or we don't know whether it's high or not because the patient can't tell us. People are tired, they, they're numb, etc. So just have Sometimes that. Sometimes they, they deprogram a bit and suddenly they're, they're off and therefore it's not reliable exactly. to check anymore. So, I mean, uh, th that's exactly what I do. And I think you're, you're talking a lot of sense. Uh, and it's amazing how even just that one little tip will make a big difference to dentists because quite often we're just rushing to get in. We don't do, you know, if you don't have articulating paper there ready on your bracket table before you start a procedure, which you'd be amazed, mm -hmm. you know, we know how many colleagues don't do this. Yeah. You know, it's just got to be there. And then only when it's there will you start checking. Um, I mean, uh, there's probably more we could cover, but in the interest of time, I just want to say, wow, 
I want to say that, that that was exactly what I hoped and much more. The next restoration I do, I'm going to follow this protocol. <laughs> okay. Because oh, I, I, I remember doing this protocol in Singapore uh, once. I was taught this actually, but it didn't make sense to me at the time because what that educator didn't cover is the whole, the IDS type flowable layer. And because he didn't cover that, I was, I had a doubt about the dentine being sealed. Um, now that you've really helped me with this missing piece of my puzzle, uh, I can't wait because already I, I take so much care and attention with my um, um, marginal ridge, just like you. When I come to my build up, I'm doing cusp by cusp by cusp. And yeah, it's nice, and, but it's, it's taking too long. So I cannot mm. wait to, to, to adapt my technique uh, because it just makes sense to me. And I'm always open to, to change our protocols when it actually makes sense. Uh, and I'll feed back to you how that goes. Um, mm. I really want everyone to, to support, uh, you know, people come on the show. So I'm sure a lot of people liked you, the, your parables and, and, and your techniques. Mm. And there's so much to learn from you. Uh, tell us about uh, the courses you run, where to follow you on Instagram. Just how can we learn more from you, my friend? Because I think, you know, you, you, you talk a lot of sense. I would encourage you all to, to follow on and learn more from, from Ahmed Tadfi. I'll put all his links in there. But just please give us a flavor of, of, of where we can learn more from you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I have a, it's Dr. Tadfi is my Instagram um, account. Um, we have also uh, currently with my colleague, um, Ahmed Hussein, we have a composite artistry course that we're running um, both a live demo course, which is in-house in the practice where we go through these principles and then actually demonstrate it on a live patient. Uh, so uh, an anterior and a posterior on the same day. And then we are now running uh, a two day uh, composite artistry course where one day is focused on anterior composite restorations with Ahmed Hassan and uh, posterior with myself, um, which uh, is in May and September. I don't have the dates off the top of my head, but those are the two we'll, provisional we'll dates. On. We'll put the show links on. That would yeah. be really great to have. May is almost booked, so if you want to do that, just uh, hurry up. Uh, but September, there's there's still a few places up for grabs, and I would highly recommend the Style Italiano Daily Menu course. That that, mm -hmm. that was the course that changed my life, actually, Amazing. hands on heart. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't want to finish the episode without just giving, and I, you know, I know we mentioned uh, Lewis McKenzie a few times here, uh, and I mentioned him once before um, in my email newsletter to everyone, just um, how, how how sorely he'll be missed by the profession. But uh, just to also just highlight again, how many of great, you know, I see you as a great clinician, my friend, but how many great clinicians he spawned and he inspired to become great, in in my opinion, you know, Dipesh Palmer, Shiraz Khan, yourself, he really was the um shining light for for for, for you, you clinicians if you don't mind me saying because 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 I, I you all have the same story about you link it back to the inspiration you received from that great man so uh, i think it'd be mm -hmm. nice just giving one last you know a, a tribute on the show we'll always remember him i'll always keep mentioning him but it was nice that you mentioned him as one of your mentors uh, and so uh, always you know let's say thank you to our mentors when we can and wherever you are in your career always think back to the people uh, that helped you and so he, he was one uh, ahmed thanks so much for for covering uh, so much so much depth it's amazing how you can go so deep into such a, a daily bread and butter a topic and I, and I loved it and i didn't know what to expect i didn't know if this would be a half an hour episode it's now going to be 90 minutes of cpd which uh comes to you of, of you and your hard work i'm sorry. definitely going to put you all the no please don't say sorry i think this is going to be a, a, a pivotal this is going to be a best of protrusive episode i loved it i loved it so much because I am going to go away and completely change how I approach something that's so routine and so, 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 so bread and butter for me. So I'm, I'm really excited because I'll be able to implement this literally on Monday, like literally Saturday today on Monday, I'll do it Tuesday. I'll fly to Chicago for American <laughs> Corporation Society. So, so totally excited for that, mm -hmm. but super, super excited to, to implement this. Ahmed, thank you so much. P please, can, please. Can, can I just one quick thing about implementing the technique before you guys do it on a patient? The easiest way to do it is just take a piece of composite, roll a pizza dough or a, a, a chapati or a flatbread and use your instruments that you have in clinic. I, I, I appreciate not everyone has what we have, but just use what you usually use and practice just on a piece of dough, the, mm -hmm. the lines and how to place the lines just before you do it on a patient. So you familiarize yourself with how like far to go. How right. Oh, just even on a piece of paper, uh, a dark yeah. piece of paper, just roll a piece of composite and flatten it like a, a chapati or something and just cut it and just feel the, 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 the composite and, and the, the instrument. And thank you again for listening. No, no, no. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to reemphasize the t top tip you gave in case someone was multitasking, they, you know, someone's chopping onions, they missed it. 
the whole thing about not dragging, you know, the whole thing about not dragging and then the cutting motion, that's a, that's a real pearl right there. So um, uh, those of us on Protrusive Guidance, uh, our network, please, Amit, join us on Protrusive Guidance, uh, you know, on the forum and stuff, uh, and then have a look that's at, so, you know, I know that Protrusive Rati are really going to gain a lot and then go away and start doing this, and then they'll be posting their cases on our little bit special forum <laughs> on there. So it'd be great for you to see what your, your work and how you've inspired everyone. Uh, and, and so please do join us on there. So I'm excited to see uh, all the restorations we'll be doing and, and sharing with each other. Uh, and let's see how, how uh, our two parties are looking as well. Uh, Ahmed, <laughs> thank you so much once again, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. You can sense from this excitement as we come to this end how brilliant that was. I truly hope you felt the same way. You're probably going to need some time to digest this one, so please head over to protrusive.app, Protrusive Guidance, and find the section that correlates this episode because we're going to post some goodies here to help you implement these changes in your practice. I'm going to be auditing my results from using this technique, and I'll keep you updated on there as well. This was a meaty one worth 1.5 hours of CPD, and all you have to do is answer the quiz. The quiz is available on either the premium package or the ultimate education package on Protrusive Guidance. One of the questions that we have for this episode is why is Dr. Tadfi not using etch on the dentine? So why is he not using etch on the dentine? Is it A, to reduce post-op sensitivity? Is it B, to prevent overetching? Is it C, because he's using a two-step bonding agent? Or is it D, because he's using a universal bonding agent? There's one key reason why not to etch dentine, and we did address that in the episode. Did you actually listen to that part? Did you actually listen to the whole way? And also your understanding of what we say. In the show notes, I will put a bit more about how you can follow Dr. Tadfi and check out his teaching programs as well. Now, I just want to read out some fan mail or some words of appreciation that the Petrusrati send out. This one here is from Dr. Abid Ansari. Abid said, I can't thank you enough for creating this amazing platform. I never got into podcasts for one reason or another. Now, I cannot spend a day without listening to your voice sharing a dental pearl. I registered to Protrusive Guidance before its launch. I have dental subscriptions for almost everything that's out there, but Protrusive is the best investment I've ever made. And Abed, thanks for letting me kindly share that with the Protrusive I really appreciate it, my friend. The next two episodes, because actually I've got a two-part now, is about the BioClear. It's about the BioClear system. Not necessarily as a matrix, not doing the focus on the matrix. Of course, we'll talk about the BioClear matrix, but I'm more interested in the BioClear philosophy. I'm a real big fan of David Clark, the inventor of the BioClear system. I think he's like this quirky, mad scientist kind of guy. But actually, I'm so proud to be hosting Dr. David Carroll and Diana McKenna, Petrusarati. This is, you know, David's an actual Petrusarati. You'll see him on the YouTube channel, just commenting kind words underneath the lessons. Uh, and it's great that, uh, I'm just amazed that a prostodontist from the States like him with the, with the caliber of the cases that he has actually tunes in. And, it, and it's so humble. You'll see from the, the next episode how humble and kind he is. And he, you know, really embodies all the values of a Petrusarati. So stay tuned for that. I think you guys need a bit of a, a drink or something after this one, because this was a heavy one, but I'm hoping it's been an absolute game changer. Anyway, well, catch you same time, same place next week. Bye for now. Just a quick thanks to the producer, Erica Allen Benitez. Editor for this video was Jan Arkial. The Prima notes were diligently created by Chrisel, Dr. Chrisel Fakun. And of course, your CPD queen helping with the transcript and the premium notes is Marie Benitez. Every episode, I wanted to give a shout out to my champions, my team members. 